when we talk about our policy today, I am not talking about the British fleet on the Potomac River and the British Army climbing up the stairs of the White House with lit torches uh, a couple hundred years ago. I'm not talking about defending the homeland. I'm talking about the policy of how we employ our national security capabilities in a global world as it exists today. And that gets into questions like preventing regional instability, preventing disruption of commerce, championing the oppressed, aiding the freedom seekers, stopping nuclear proliferators and regimes who are actively providing lethal aid uh, and materials against our troops overseas. These are the kinds of questions where we have to ask ourselves, can just negotiation do a trick, or do we need to deploy some force, some kind of, of force or persuasion uh, that goes beyond just normal, old-school diplomatic negotiation? I think that the question that comes to my mind most for me, uh, other than the recent Camp Ashraf situation, I, I was looking into the history of our acting on humanitarian causes. and. It's interesting that there's a lot of always humanitarian causes out there. The, the, the globe is a sorry place, as I say. We've got Darfur, where we did something. Libya, where we're around the edges, sort of. Rwanda comes to mind. And if you deal with a kind of genocide that took place in Rwanda, and Rwanda, and you're thinking about human rights and so forth, you think, my gosh, is there any excuse for us sitting on our hands during that terrible event? When four to five hundred thousand people, ethnic tribes people, uh, got murdered, it, the answer is: if that isn't a trigger for the United States of America to do something, uh, then what is the line? What is the line we use to make a decision? Do our policymakers use now? Now, if it's an oppressed nation, who makes the decision about how to relieve the oppression so that the people in that nation can express themselves in a way that will affect regime change? Can you actually do that? So that, that gets to my second, my second question. Okay, let's suppose we want regime change. We all agree. We go all around and all the players say, yep, bad guy needs to get out of there. So how do you do that? I mean, it, you've got to have some way to make that happen. Now, I, I know that the negotiations, use of force, you uh, have presented a third way, which I think is uh, obviously a very sensible, appropriate way to proceed, of letting the people express themselves and take it over and do the job. My worry there is always how much is it going to cost? Already we've had freedom fighters we've seen in my lifetime in Hungary and since then many times in many places who have gone out and done the demonstration, done the hard work, uh, and been repressed again, but have sent the message to the world that they need help, they want people behind them for their to assume the freedoms they look for. These, these questions of what you employ to get regime change are unanswered. Now, I am not advocating targeted assassinations of leaders we do not like. That's a lousy game to start. It's a slippery slope, and you go downhill. But I am saying in places where our national security is threatened or where real genocide is going on, we have capabilities that we can use effectively to take the mischief makers out of the program. And I think that is an area that we need to spend more time focusing on. You hope that in most situations that won't happen. But it is important to know that the United States of America, because it has had to develop that capabilities to protect itself, has indeed protected 